Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Branch Community Church. Would you please sing with us? Let's sing this together. Our God, a firm foundation. Our God, a firm foundation. Our rock, the only solid nations rise and fall kingdoms once strong now shaken we trust forever in your name the name of Jesus we trust the name of Jesus you are the only king forever Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Expectations, our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. Oh, we trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious.
Well, good morning and welcome to Church Online. We couldn't be happier to know that for the first time all over the city, people are beginning to gather together in our house churches. All throughout this time of quarantine and social distancing, we've been looking forward to the day that we'd be able to gather together again. And while we still have a little way to go, we praise the Lord this morning for the blessings that we do have. And so whether you're in a place today with five people or 50 people, let's lift our voices in unison and gratitude to our great God for this gift of gathering. Let's sing.
How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was a I know that it is finished It is finished Oh It is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection His wounds have paid my ransom But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom God, we thank you for the truth of that gospel Lord, we know that by your stripes we are healed. So God, no matter what we're facing, would you remind us that through the work of your Son, you have called us children. God, we thank you and we praise you because you are our good Father and your love for us runs so deep. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, good morning, Branch Community Church. My name is Alex Wickle, and I'm the associate pastor here. And I have some announcements for you as we continue in our service. The first thing that I wanna say is if you're new here, we are so glad that you've tuned in and we just wanna give you clarity on how to get connected here at our church. So at the top of your screen, you should see a thing that says connection card. And basically by filling this out, this is your fast pass to getting connected and you have an opportunity to ask questions and we would just love to help you any way that we can. We're just really glad that you've joined us. Now, if you do consider this your church home, I I wanna say that we are so grateful for your faithful financial partnership, and especially through this pandemic, all the things that we do as a church simply would not be possible without your partnership. So thank you for joining us in our mission, which is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. Now, just last night, uh, our church did something as we try to uh, go through the process of regathering. And so we had a drive-in service, and it was a phenomenal time. As people came in their cars, and we sang, and we prayed, and we heard from God's word, it was really a phenomenal thing. But really, that's not the only thing our church is doing to regather. In fact, today is a very special Sunday. It is the launch of our network of house churches all across the north side of the city. So welcome to all of our house churches this morning. Now, I do wanna say that if you're somebody that's still trying to figure out when you're ready to uh, you know, come out of your home and regather and, and figure that out, everybody's in different places and that's totally okay. But I do wanna say this very clearly. Uh, it is not too late to get connected. So either whether it's this week or in the weeks to come, if you're like, hey, I wanna take that next step and get connected to a house church, just send me an email and I would love to help you find a place where you can begin the process of regathering here at the branch. Well, those are all the announcements that I have. In a moment, we're gonna hear from our lead pastor, Robbie DeMerney, as he kicks off a new series through the book of James called Show Me Your Faith. Good morning, Branch family and friends. It is so great to have you with us this morning. It's a great day for you to join us this weekend because we are actually starting a brand new series where we're diving into a book in the New Testament called James. It's a great, awesome, awesome little book. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible because it's incredibly practical and just gets right up in our grill saying, here's how you live out your faith on a daily basis. James basically wants his readers to become fully mature followers of Jesus by doing what God's word says. That's the overarching theme of James. It's like he's daring these young believers and daring you and I, show me your faith. Show me your faith. I dare you, is what James says. He says, faith without works is useless. He says, if you're not gonna do something about what you say you believe, you might as well not even say it. For all practical purposes, why even call yourself a follower of Jesus if you're not gonna do what God's word says, if you're not gonna live it out? I mean, he just calls us out. He says that faith really can't even save you. Pretty much says, hey, if you're not gonna do what you say you believe, don't even bother. In a very clear and direct way, James lays out what a living, active faith looks like. He basically says, here's what you're supposed to do with what you say you believe. Here's how you can show other people, everyone, your faith. So I just wanna encourage us, as we go through this book together, I would challenge you to immerse yourself in this book. Maybe make it a challenge, you're gonna read through it all the way through, all five chapters, at least once or twice, because it is a letter, even though it reads kind of differently than a letter. Maybe what you wanna do is download it on your Bible app and listen to it as you're out walking around the neighborhood or on your, on your commute to work. It'd be really great if you just immersed yourself in this little book. If you wanna go the extra mile, maybe you do what Kim did several years ago when she ran the Chi-Town Marathon. She actually memorized the entire book. <laughs> I know that's a little over the top, but maybe that's what God's calling you to. I'm just telling you, I believe this little book and the series we're gonna go through together this summer could be an incredible, significant part of your spiritual journey as we go through this together. So let's just dive right in. Verse one, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Now, James was the half-brother of Jesus, which would have been just too wild. I mean, can you imagine growing up with Jesus as your brother? Like, why can't you be more like your brother? Couldn't you just hear that constantly? You know, but James had a hard time actually believing that his brother was the Messiah, which I can imagine. It didn't happen until much later in his life, actually after the resurrection. And here in this book, he's writing to Jewish Christians who'd been scattered because of the widespread persecution that broke out after the stoning of Stephen. 
James kind of just gives us a quick hello, and then he dives right in to pretty much the toughest topic imaginable. I- I'm sure his wife wanted to say, uh, honey, are you sure you want to start there as he writes this book? I mean, you just got to understand, I think maybe his thought process, again, being directed by the Holy Spirit, I'm sure, but he says, we better get this one out of the way early on, because if they don't get this, they're not going to get any of it. If you're going to show others your faith, if you're going to let other people believe that your faith is legit and credible, you're going to have to understand that in the day-to-day living, there's going to be some incredibly hard stuff that comes into your life. It's not just about living your faith out on Sunday. It's a Monday through Saturday. It's an everyday kind of faith. And here's the thing you got to understand. And here's what, what I want you to know. Your faith, my faith, is so incredibly important to God that God is going to actually bring some things into your life or at least allow some things in your life that you're gonna kinda go, really, God? Why? Why, God? And what he's trying to do is help us be able to show our faith as we respond and learn to view trials as coming from or actually being allowed by God in order to build our faith muscles. Now, faith is like a muscle, and you know this. If you wanna build a muscle, what do you gotta do? You gotta work it to exhaustion and then let it rest. You gotta tear it down and then let it rest. You gotta repeat that process over and over again. James is about to say, in the same way, your God is so interested in helping you develop a strong, active, living faith that God is going to build your spiritual muscle. He's gonna do whatever it takes to do that, to move you beyond just a childlike, simple faith to an actually mature, living, active faith so that it affects your marriage, so that it affects your relationship with your kids, so it affects your job and and, and the way you love your neighbors and your attitude and your words and your actions. It all is gonna be affected by your faith, and James is gonna give us some incredibly practical advice about this. So he begins with this incredibly difficult subject. Verse two, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me almost just wanna close my Bible and go, this dude's a lunatic. He's not living in a real world. How could he possibly say, count it as joy? Joy and trials clearly don't go together, right? But if you remember who's writing this, James was very, very familiar. You have to take him seriously because he was very acquainted with trials, with grief, with persecution. He actually ended up being a martyr. And he's writing to a group of people who were way too familiar with trials because these were Jews who had become Christians. And they discovered that God actually wanted to be their personal heavenly father, that Jesus truly was their Messiah. And just as they're like beginning this journey and they're thinking just like we do when we first start to follow Jesus, it doesn't get any better than this. It's like the carpet was pulled out from under them. And they're just going like, what is going on? And they're scattered, you know, because this persecution broke out. They're scattered to all these different countries and, and they had to leave their homes and their families were divided. Many of them lived in just total poverty. And I'm sure they were asking the same kind of questions that we ask, even in the middle of this pandemic, where there's no end in sight, as we all continue to ask, hey, hey, God, where are you? God, why would you allow this? God, what are you doing? What are you up to? And in that culture and religion that they grew up in, it was very much like ours today, where if things are going well, it's because you have the blessing of God. If things are going bad, it's because you have fallen out of favor with God, and it must be something that you've done to cause that. Either, bottom line is, something's either wrong with God or something's wrong with them. And James is gonna say here, no, 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 my friends, here's what you gotta understand. Whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it a time of pure joy, to which they're just as baffled as we are. I mean, it's kind of hard to wrap our minds around, isn't it? As followers of Jesus, when we face trials, there should always be present an element of joy. It should be evident right in the middle of it. And James is going to explain why. And in doing so, he's gonna help us to understand from God's perspective what a trial is. He says this, whenever you face trials of many kinds, count it as joy, verse three, because, and again, he knew we were gonna wanna know why, because that's just how he wired us, because you know that the testing of your faith And that little phrase defines from us, from from God's perspective, what a trial is. You know how God defines a trial in your life? God sees trials as a testing of your faith. 
When we say, God, the world's falling apart. God, I just don't understand why you would allow this. God, what are you up to? What are you doing? God, I don't like this. All through that, God's going, I'm testing your faith. I'm testing your faith. Just trust me. And we have to understand that those things either come from or they're allowed by God. As a believer, as a follower of Jesus, anytime evil or tragedy or comes into my life, whether it's a job thing, a health thing, a, a relationship thing, a money thing, a wayward child thing, whatever that trial might be, from God's perspective, we have to understand it is actually a testing of our faith. In every situation, in every trial we face, from God's perspective, it's a testing of our faith. Now, why is it a test of our faith? Come on, you know the answer to that, don't you? Because when bad things happen, what do we tend to do? When difficulty comes into our life, immediately we look up and we cry out, oh God, where are you? Oh God, rescue me. Oh God, what are you doing? God, why? I mean, all of a sudden, God has our undivided attention, doesn't he? And the thing we have to understand is that God knew that we were gonna get that phone call. God knew exactly what the doctor was gonna say to us. God knew about that situation long before it ever blindsided us at work. God knew about this pandemic long before any of us did and the racial tension and the violence and the horrible violence in our city. Friends, God wants us to view every single trial as an opportunity, an opportunity to trust him and receive his joy, an opportunity to believe that God is good and that he's at work even in the midst of it. And our hope and our desire is that God is going to rescue us, to not let it hurt too bad, to, to not let it get too deep. God, God, don't let me go too low. God, God, please, surely they're gonna find a cure for this. God, surely a vaccine is coming soon. And suddenly in the midst of our trials, what happens is our faith, our, our really sort of comfortable faith, there's this tension because our confidence so often is in what the good things that God provides for us, the good things that God does for us. You see, it's very seldom in our little wrinkle-free lives. And isn't that what you want? Isn't that what I want? I want a wrinkle-free life where things are going well, where, where, where just, you know, God is good and the birds are chirping and the sun is shining and, and things are good. I mean, everybody's healthy and doing fine. We got food on the table, a nice place to lay our head. We, we drive a nice car around town. Can we admit that we really like that kind of lifestyle? And the longer we can have that, the, the prolonged seasons of that, the more comfortable we get. But let's be honest, those times, those seasons where everything is going well, really don't do a whole lot for our faith, do they? Because we tend so often to just forget about God. Oh, we might tip our cap to him and say thank you when we pray over our meal, but at the end of the day, we mostly lose that sense of desperation. We lose that sense of total dependence. Our tendency is to kind of ignore God when we're living in that wrinkle-free stage of life. But James says, when the bottom drops out, when you get that phone call, when you get that letter from the IRS, when you get served those papers that you never thought would come your way, when you get put on furlough and there's no way that could ever happen to you, when the adversity comes knocking on your door, friends, hey, there is a heightened interaction between us and God, right? And we have to decide, we have to make a choice. Are we gonna choose to believe that God's got this, that he's got you, he's got me right in the middle of it, that God is there with us? There's this tension and there's this opportunity for our faith muscles to be stretched beyond humanly possible and to absolute exhaustion, but there's an incredible chance for us to grow. And James says, now look, if you're someone who wants to show others your faith, a living and active and growing faith, if you're someone who really wants to honor God and not just have a Sunday run of the mill, go through the motions kind of faith, you have to view your trials as an opportunity, a test of your faith. And then he goes on and gives us some more information. Here's what he says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces something, it produces perseverance. It produces perseverance. The end result of all of this is perseverance, endurance, just hanging in there, holding on for dear life. As things get worse and worse and worse, yeah, God, you can still count on me to trust you, to believe that you are good, to believe that you are God, to believe that you are still moving. I believe in you, God, no matter what. 
even as all the things that I used to put my faith and trust in you because of all the good gifts that you bestowed on me, God, even though those things are just slowly one by one being stripped away, God, I still trust you. God, I still believe that you're good and that you're God and that you're up to something. See, a person with active and growing and living faith, that's how they'll respond to trials, when the bottom falls out. And that's what God is looking for. Are we willing to see our trials as coming from God and an opportunity to grow no matter what? Look at verse four. Let perseverance finish its work so that, and it gives us a definition here of spiritual maturity, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let me tell you, friends, spiritual maturity is not how much you know about God. It's not how many Bible verses you have memorized. Spiritual maturity is simply about endurance. It's not about knowledge, it's about perseverance. And God's goal for you <clears throat> in your trial is that you would come out of it perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And he defines that very simply. He said perfect, lacking nothing kind of faith is not about knowing everything, or being a great scholar, or being a great anything, or even being great at anything. He says spiritual maturity is found in your ability to endure to hang in there, to persevere, and to hold on and cling to Jesus no matter what. Even when you don't see a whole lot to hang on to, you simply trust God and you trust his character. You hold on because of who he is and what he has done on the cross through Jesus for you. That's the point God wants to get us to. Basically, here's what James is saying. Adversity does not equal absence, but rather activity. And what I mean by that is not activity of like running around, how can I fix all this? The activity of understanding that God is at work behind the scenes. God is at work in your heart doing something way deeper than you could ever understand. And that he's given you the opportunity in the midst of it to choose joy. Because when the bottom falls out, the good news is that God is still there and that God is enough and that God cares and is incredibly active. And I know we all wish that it didn't work that way. I know we all wish God would just kind of move on down the road and, and teach somebody else about this persevering, enduring kind of faith. But friends, we actually can have, and there should and could be, an element of joy woven into our sorrow, even when we're going through the deepest sense of adversity, because we realize that God is not absent. God is incredibly present, and God is working actively, big time, growing us and shaping us and conforming us to the image of Christ. Basically what he's doing, he's taking away all the scaffolding. All those things that we usually tend to prop ourselves up with, God just takes them away one at a time. And he allows these difficulties to come into our life to see if we truly are trusting him and him alone. So friends, the book of James says this is the way. And we find this throughout the New Testament, by the way, and you will understand this from your own experience as well, the greatest compliment that can be paid to someone is when we maintain faith in them, when honestly everything around us, outside of their character, says otherwise. <laughs> like when we truly maintain faith in someone, when there's really nothing else to put our faith in other than their character, that's powerful. That's how we honor someone. In the same way, that's the purest form of worship. That's the purest expression of our desire to follow God is when there's really nothing else to hang our hat on, to hang our faith on than the fact that we believe God is who he says he is and that he did what he said he did and that his work was completed on the cross through Jesus Christ. Friends, that is authentic, enduring faith in spite of all the chaos that might be happening in us and all around us. Are we gonna fix our eyes on Jesus and find that he is truly enough? Now, let me tell you, this isn't my favorite part of the Bible, and it's not the easiest part of the Bible to preach. The truth is, though, this is the part that most honors God, and this is where he wants to take us. Now, I know this from personal experience, because my wife, Kim, her love for me shines the brightest in the darkest and most difficult times. It's not, you know, like most days when I'm like winning husband of the year for serving her so faithfully as Christ served the church and when I'm esteeming her as better than myself and, and everything is wonderful and I'm just being the most, you know, like amazing trophy husband on the planet. No, when I know Kim loves me the most is when I'm the most unlovable, when I'm having a bad day, when I'm having a bad week, 
When, when, when I'm kind of grumpy and feeling very, very unlovable, like the time when I fell into a funk after my father died and I didn't have, take the time or the space that I needed to grieve appropriately, Kim just continued to love me unconditionally for way longer than honestly should be humanly possible. But friends, that more than any other time showed me her unconditional love for me. In the same way, God is most honored by his children when we maintain faithfulness when there's nothing else to hold on to other than the fact of who he is and what he's done on the cross through Jesus because he wants us to love us. He wants us to love him for who he is and what he's done in Christ rather than who we want him to be and what he's done for us lately. But you see, I'm just like you. My joy and my faith are so often based on my circumstances and what he's done for me lately. And James says, let's get rid of all that stuff. Let's strip it all away. And you have to learn to look at adversity through a different set of lenses. And thankfully, he tells us how in verse five, look at it. Gives us some incredibly practical advice. He says, if any of you, remember this is in the context of suffering, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. He says, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of personal crisis, in the middle of like the bottom dropping out, simply ask God for wisdom. Beg God for wisdom. Now, what do we normally beg God for? God, help. God, I want relief. God, rescue me. God, get me out of this. God, don't let it hurt too bad. And what we need to pray is, God, help me to see this the way that you see it. See, that's what wisdom is, to see things the way that God sees them so that we are able to respond in a way that truly honors God. So this is how we please God, is when we're in the middle of it, we seek out wisdom. We go to him and we beg God, God, I wanna see this in the way that you see it and I wanna respond to you appropriately. Give me the power to do that. Give me your wisdom. And you know what the Bible promises? If you have faith, in the middle of your trials, in the middle of your tribulations and troubles, and you pray, God, give me the wisdom, look at what he says. <laughs> he goes here in verse six, this is powerful. When you run not from God, but to God, and you ask, verse six, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Why? Because belief is the point. Building your faith and strengthening your faith and helping your faith to endure is the very point. So it's not about going to him in doubt, but going to him in faith and believing because the one who doubts, look what it says, is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Verse seven, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now, what I believe he's talking about here is that person, and we're all guilty of this at times, I know I certainly am, I know you probably think that I get a pass or an exemption because I'm a pastor, but listen, it's hard for me not to doubt when trials come knocking on my door as well. But when things are bad, we're just, we tend to be filled with doubt and fear and God, where are you? And God, how could you? And God, why would you? And we tend to wonder, is God really there? Sometimes we even tend to wander and find other things to sort of self-medicate and, and try to help us get through it. Rather than turning and looking fully at Jesus and realizing that him dying on the cross is enough, the, the promise of security, you know, of being with him forever and eternity is enough no matter what we go through here on earth. And yet we get so just overwhelmed by, God, I want you to fix this now. I want my comfort now. God, please fix this quick. God, I, I want no more pain, no more pandemic, no more of this racial divide, no more political polarization. God, I'm tired of all of it. God, please fix this now. I'm telling you, friends, when we go to God in the midst of our trials and our troubles and we ask for his wisdom to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear and the heart that is open to receive what God has for us in the midst of it, I'm telling you, it's a powerful thing. When God shows up, he honors that kind of heart and that kind of prayer. Now, let me tell you why I believe this to be true. And I know you go, well, Pastor, the Bible says it, so surely it's true. And yes, that's true, but let's be honest. Sometimes when we're going through it, God's word just doesn't seem sufficient. I know it should be, but sometimes it just doesn't seem like it. But I can tell you, as a pastor, I've had a front row seat to watch dozens, probably hundreds of people, hundreds and hundreds of people go through the most incredibly horrific, difficult times, and I've seen two kinds of people. I've seen people go through trials and tribulations and have their faith literally destroyed. 
I've seen people abandon their faith completely and get mad at God and mad at the church and mad at me and want nothing more to do with Jesus, just completely turn their back and walk the other way. I've seen plenty of people on that end of the spectrum, but I've also seen people walk through the most unfathomable pain. I'm talking about stuff that you would just literally start weeping if I told you the stories of what happened to these people, and I watched them persevere. I watched them endure. I watched them just lean harder and harder into Jesus and trust him no matter what and believe that in spite of their circumstances, in spite of the fact there's nothing more to hang their faith onto, they believe that God is good, that God is moving and working, and, and because Jesus came to die for them. There's no reason for them to question his goodness, even in the midst of their deepest, darkest hour. And I've seen these people come through, not only with their faith intact, but with it strengthened. And I honestly have to wonder, and I'm sure maybe you do as well, God, what would I do if I were in their shoes facing those circumstances? And that's why these verses are so scary and bother us so much, because we don't really know, do we? And you know why that is? Because our faith, is not complete and perfect yet. It just simply isn't. We're not complete, lacking nothing. We just aren't there yet. But I wanna tell you about one particular lady that I have known and loved for over 20 years now that so powerfully exemplifies this. Over a year ago, her son, her only son, went missing in March. And for months and months, they searched for him. And her husband's deadly cancer returned with a vengeance. After months of searching, in the same week, her husband loses his fierce battle with cancer and they find her son's remains. She lost her son and her husband in the same week. This woman literally had to bury her son and her husband on the same day. I can't even imagine, friends. But let me tell you something. I watched and I'm still watching an amazing picture of enduring and persevering faith. I've watched Jesus shine through this woman like no other person I've seen. Friends, that is a woman whose faith has been perfected, whose faith has been completed, and she's lacking nothing. And far greater than any sermon that I will ever preach, I'm telling you, her life and her faith has touched so many lives and touched them so much deeper than any sermon ever will. Friends, this is deep water stuff, but it's where God wants to take you and where he wants to take me, to a place where we see trials as an opportunity for God to grow and deepen an enduring, persevering kind of faith. To see that trials doesn't mean God has left us, but that God is with us, he's active, he's present, he's doing far greater than we could ever imagine. And then he wraps up this little passage here in verse 12. And if we could just begin to see things this way, I'm telling you, look at verse 12. Here's what he says. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, get this, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And he paints for us this little image that doesn't, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of details on, but basically at the end of their life, when it's all said and done, there will be a special section in heaven reserved for them for those who had this incredible, enduring, persevering faith, there will be a special reward just for them because in their life, their faith endured. Their faith persevered through circumstances. It caused other people to turn their back on God. And so God wants to reward them in a very special way. Why? Because they loved God. And ultimately, friends, that's what it's really all about. He wants to develop in you he wants to develop in me, in each one of us, a faith that perseveres, a faith that trusts him no matter what, not because of all the gifts that he bestows on us, but simply for who he is and what he has done through Jesus on the cross. He is enough. Will you trust him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Man, this little book is so powerful and it just comes out with a gut punch right in the beginning to say, hey, you can count it all joy. You can see this opportunity to have incredible joy even in the midst of your darkest hour 
if you will choose to trust me, if you will beg me for wisdom, if you will fix your eyes on Jesus and the completed work that he accomplished on the cross. So God, I pray. I know there's people going through it right now. I know there's people that just feel like they're at the very end of their road. God, I pray you'd wrap your arms around them, you'd love them, you'd hold them close, but Lord, you would help them to just absolutely put their faith and their trust in you and nothing else that they would find your grace to be sufficient, that you are enough, that what you did on the cross is enough. Help us to remember that. It's in the strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, one of the reasons that we have such a hard time reading a passage like this and believing that it could actually be reality in our life is because we forget. We forget what Jesus has already done for us. And Jesus knew this was gonna be our tendency. And so he gave us a very real and practical way to remember. So if you're in a host home right now, you can go ahead and turn the, 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 the live feed off because your host leader is gonna lead you through communion right now. If you're gonna stay online, I'm gonna guide us through this together. This is something the church has been doing for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Believers around the world, this is the way that Jesus taught us to remember his death, to remember the price that he paid for you and for me. On the very night that he was betrayed, Jesus, sitting around the table with his disciples, the very people that were about to betray him, and he says, guys, I want you to remember what I'm about to do for you. So Jesus took the bread and he said, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat this and remember me. And then Jesus took a cup. Hopefully you've got something there that could represent the blood of Jesus. And that's what this cup is. It's a symbol to remind us of the blood of Jesus that was shed for our sin. Because the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. But Jesus took the cup, said this cup represents the new covenant. My blood is gonna be spilled out for you so that you can be made right with God. Every time you drink this, remember me. Father, thank you so much for sending your very best, for enduring the most incredible trial deeper and darker than anything we could ever imagine, the cross. Thank you for sending your son to die for us so that we could be right with you. We love you so much. Help us not to forget, but to remember what you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.